high above the earth, slowly rotating through the silent voids of space, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Star Lab. Here, the International Space Authority, ISA, watches over an eternity of uncharted galaxies and the countless planets orbiting within their starlit borders. For six days and nights, two drone laboratory pods, the Osiris and the Anubis, have been floating in a safety orbit 1,500 kilometers beyond Star Lab. Aboard the Anubis, physicist Paul Kramer is completing a dangerous hydrogen plasma experiment. 200 meters away aboard the Osiris, Star Lab research director Maura Cassidy is monitoring the experiment's data and relaying it to the Mycroft computer aboard Star Lab. It is July 19th, 2026, 0815 Universal Interstellar Time, as this week's adventure, The Keeper of Eight, takes us from the routine of a deep space laboratory experiment into the mysterious light and shadow of alien worlds. Paul, check the plasma chamber seals again. I'm still getting a red light on number four. I read triple zero across the board, Maura. There must be an indicator malfunction on your end. Let's cross-check it. Osiris to Star Lab. You there, Valerie? Valerie? <laughs> oh, Dr. Reed, good morning. Oh, <coughs> sorry, Maura. You caught me with a mouthful of toast. Anyway, Paul's right. My clock also reads triple zero. Oh, you mean I've got a short circuit? Oh. How embarrassing. Well, do you think you could stop blushing long enough to spacewalk on over here? Just as soon as I get my helmet on. Why, what's the problem? The valence analyzer I brought up from Terra was a gift from the Institute. And I sure don't want to leave it behind. Laura, I'm going to need your help taking it apart so we can get through the airlock. Okay. Shoot the umbilical over and I'll show you why I almost ran away with the circus to be a tighter up walker. Here it comes. Umbilical secure. I'm on my way. Depressurizing her airlock, Mora swings open the hatch and floats from the zero gravity interior of the Osiris into the starlit vacuum of deep space. Her tinted glass helmet and metallic yellow pressure suit glittering in the clean, white light of the sun. Oh, oh, can you see me? <laughs> I sure can. Loud and clear. What's so funny? <laughs> You're upside down. Uh, wait a minute. Maura, I'm reading a ship in the area, 057 and closing. Do you see it? Hold on. Let me get turned around. Oh, yeah. Yes, I see it. It's black. There aren't any markings. It's, it's oh, it's shaped like a bat. Tremendous wings. It, it's moving into a parking orbit directly above us. Something's coiling out of one of those nose vents. Looks like a metallic black snake. Oh, oh it's moving towards. <laughs> the nearby Stargazer security station, Captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff, unaware of what has happened at Vector 448, inspect the new ISA Deep Space Interceptor, Solaris. Four Alpha Sunburst engines, primary and secondary energy absorbent field generators, high density particle deflectors. Hey, this baby's really loaded. Yeah, hard beam photon shielding, five dual laser turrets, and a modified Starsmith Parsec Accelerator. Now tell me, buddy, what more could you ask for in a ship? Uh, how about a Michelle and a Mitzi? A what? A Michelle and a Mitzi. Is that some kind of top secret equipment I haven't heard about? Uh, not exactly, Skipper. Uh, Michelle and Mitzi are those two terrific looking inspectors standing over there. Oh. And from where I stand, 
their equipment is anything but secret. Uh, buddy, just between you and me, have you ever been accused of having sexist leanings? Uh, let me put it this way, Skipper. Attention all paramedic search vessels. This is an emergency rescue alert. Pilots and crews report to the information office in your sector. Captains Graydon and Griff, please contact the bridge. Come on, buddy. Let's use the radio aboard the Solaris. Right. Solaris to bridge. This is Captain Graydon. I have some bad news, John. The Anubis laboratory pod exploded five minutes ago. Dr. Kramer was inside. Exploded? Dr. Kramer. What about the Osiris? What about Dr. Cassidy? Is she all right? We don't know, John. She was EVA when the Anubis blew up. Well, for God's sake, what happened? We don't know that either, buddy. They finished their experiment, and Star Lab was about to launch a shuttle to pick them up when an unidentified ship came into the area. 30 seconds later, the Anubis exploded. All right, feed the coordinates into the Solaris onboard computer. We're going out there. John Graydon and Buddy Griff streaked toward the area aboard the Solaris, followed by Stargazer rescue ships. Meanwhile, the mysterious Batwing alien vessel moves into a parking orbit behind the moon. What quantity of hydrogen plasma was withdrawn from the Earth probe by our penetrator before the explosion? 2,000 fusion cubits. Mm. Enough to fill the planet generators of every ship in the Armada. Enough for every shadow sentry, light assassin, scan watcher, and penetrator guide who wears the dark armor of Draconia. I wonder what the humanoid was doing with so vast a quantity of concentrated hydrogen. No matter. Mask, convey my compliments to the scan watcher who detected the pod and to the penetrator guide who withdrew the hydrogen with such unusual skill. I accept your thanks on their behalf, my lord. Mask, has there been any sign of the Keeper? Not since we entered this galaxy. Perhaps we've slipped away from him. Don't fool yourself, Mask. He's clever. Extremely clever. He'll find us, eventually. And when he does, He'll do everything in his power to prevent us from reaching the hydrogen fields of Terra. How much time will you need to assemble the Armada? It can be done within four solar days. Then do it. Yes, my lord. Where are you, Keeper? In this galaxy? On Terra? Or perhaps you're down there? On the dark side of the moon? As Mask prepares to assemble the Draconian Armada for an assault on Terra, and Warp fantasizes about a mysterious pursuer known only as the Keeper, John and Buddy enter Vector 448 aboard the Solaris and begin their desperate search for Mara Cassidy. Buddy, what's that on screen six? Take it easy, Skipper. Let's magnify it and have a look. It's the plasma chamber from the Anubis. Damn it. Wait, something's not quite right here, Skipper. What do you mean? The chamber's still intact. If the hydrogen plasma didn't explode, what did? I'll tell you what. I'll stay here and watch the life form scanner screen. You get down to the recovery bay and take the chamber aboard with the grapplers. We'll turn it over to the spectrograph on Star Lab. They can analyze it. Maybe they can tell us what happened. That's good. John, about Mora. She's alive until we prove otherwise, okay? Of course. I'll talk to you from recovery. Star Lab to Solaris. Solaris, go ahead, Star Lab. John, it's Valerie. Anything? We found the plasma chamber from the Anubis. It's completely intact, isn't it? Yes, it is. How did you know? I've been scanning the area on the elemental spectrum analyzers. There isn't a trace of hydrogen plasma residue. Then what caused the explosion? Skipper, get down here. What is it, buddy? The plasma chamber. There's a hole in it about the size of my fist. And so help me God, I can hear someone breathing. Buddy, Skipper, 
grab that other pulse wrench off the wall. We've got to get this thing open. Where's the hole? There, on the other side. Listen. Come on, Skipper, come on. Watch out, buddy. Mora! Take her feet, buddy. Easy. Skipper, the whole left side of her helmet is split open. Mora! Mora, can you hear me? Get her gloves off and check her fingernails. They're normal, Skipper. No sign of anoxia. Her lips are normal, too. Let's get her out of the suit. Right. Around. Right. Blinding. Take it easy, Mora. You're safe now. Oh, safe. I'm safe. Inside. Now. Buddy, hasn't it hit you yet? What? We just took Mora out of a one-ton plasma chamber, hermetically sealed from the outside, with no way in except through a six-inch hole. Now, how in the name of God did she get in there? I don't know. And Mora doesn't know either. He keeps talking about how some kind of vampire ship came up on them and did something to the Anubis that made it explode. Then there was a brilliant white light all around her, and... Well, that's all she remembers. You're sure she's all right? Positive. The body scan John did on her in the medical chamber showed that everything was perfectly normal. Well, Dr. Rossiter wants to examine her anyway. So, take her directly to sickbay when you dock. Roger, Starlab. Solaris, oh. I know what Dr. Rossiter said, Mora, but I think you should take it easy for a day or two. John, I feel fine. You better get some rope, Skip. Looks like we're gonna have to tie her down. Hi, Mara. How you feeling? Oh, Valerie. Am I ever glad to see you. What have you got there, Valerie? Your report. Um, I'd like to go over it with you. Come on, buddy. We've got work to do. We'll be down in Docking Bay 4 if you need us, Mara. All right. See you later. You look more serious than usual, Valerie. What's on your mind? How you got inside the plasma chamber. I've worn every circuit in Mycroft to a frazzle trying to figure it out. Have you tried the Houdini file? The Houdini file? Uh, it's a joke, Valerie. Oh, sorry, Mara. <laughs> My sense of humor escaped me there for a minute. Oh, yes. Well, uh, maybe we can get a volunteer from the audience to help you find it. Mm. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Cassidy. Is uh, Dr. Reed with you? Oh, yes, yes. I'm here somewhere. The Mycroft's printing out the results of your molecular transposition program. Oh, I'll be right there. Be back in a few minutes, Mara. Mm -hmm. Maybe Mycroft's finally come up with something. I hope so. What on earth? What on earth? No more and no less than on any other planet. I know your voice. Where are you? Sometimes I'm here, sometimes I'm there. I'm here, there, and everywhere. Who are you? My father was infinity. My mother was the light. I am Echo, the keeper of the Translucent fragments of cool white light materialize in Mars quarters and slowly puzzle together to form a calm, shimmering pool of ethereal radiance, free-floating in the center of the room. Mora suddenly finds herself in the presence of Echo, the Keeper of Eight, a free energy being who has suddenly manifested in the form of a radiant pool of floating light. I am the last of an ancient race of star watchers, a refugee from a parallel universe, destroyed in the subvoid annihilation that created the star system. A parallel universe? You mean there used to be more than one? There still are more now. Hundreds of them, beyond the time-space continuum of this one. What are they like? You know that as well as I do. I don't understand. <laughs> you dream, don't you? Yes, I dream. And when you do, you pass from the illusion of one universe into the illusion of another, and then another, and then another. Each is a reflection of the other, endlessly echoing through the antediluvian corridors of infinity. What happened during the explosion? Molecular dematerialization of what might have been the moment of your death. While their numbers were still disintegrating, 
I transformed you into pure energy and rematerialized you inside the plasma chamber. If I hadn't, you would have been killed by the shrapnel debris of the exploding pod. But my helmet was split open. It was struck by a pod fragment an instant before I dematerialized you. I sealed it with thought until the chamber was taken aboard the Solaris. You're lucky I happen to be in the neighborhood. Yes, lucky. I don't know what to say. I... Thank you, Echo. I... Oh, God, thank you. The vampire ship that killed Dr. Kramer is part of an armada from the Draconian system. They're preparing for an assault on the hydrogen fields of Terra. Hydrogen fields? Yes, the Draconians are preparing for an assault on the hydrogen fields on Terra? The Draconians are hydrogen fuel breathers. Even their economy is hydrogen-based. They trade it among themselves like currency. But, like any system that bases its economy on a single element, there are power struggles, greed, waste. The hydrogen vaults of Draconia are nearly empty, and a civil war is raging throughout their system for control of what remains. They need vast amounts of hydrogen to restabilize themselves, and they intend to take it from the Earth's ocean. Paul's death was an accident, wasn't it? Yes. When they penetrated the hydrogen plasma chamber, they punctured the pod's retro fuel tanks. That's what caused the explosion. Pure oxygen is one of the most explosive gases in the universe. The Earth would be saturated with it if they removed the hydrogen from our oceans. Echo, how can we stop them? Where's the Armada? What are their weaknesses? I have to leave you now, Mara. Uh, Echo! Come back, Echo! 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 Echo? He called himself Echo? Are you absolutely certain you weren't having some kind of delayed stress reaction? John, you know me better than that. And I know me better than that. I believe you, Maura. I just wanted to be sure that you believed you. It all fits, Skipper. The problem now is how to deal with the Draconians. We don't even know where they are. I don't think that draconian ship is very far away. Oh, Valerie, I forgot you were listening. Why? What makes you say that? The element scanners are reading a first magnitude concentration of hydrogen somewhere behind the moon. Hmm. That might be it. Well, there's only one way to find out. Maura, do you feel up to a little ride in the Solaris? Hmm, I certainly do. I'll meet you in the launch bay after I talk to Commissioner White. Hey, what about me? I don't know, Valerie. It could be dangerous. Danger is my middle name. Oh, I thought Daphne was your middle name. Oh, Mara. <laughs> okay, you can come along. Meet me in the communication center. Mara, is her middle name really Daphne? I was just kidding, buddy. Her middle name really is Danger. <laughs> <laughs> As Mara hurries toward the communication center, John and Buddy enter a pneumatic lift and descend to the launch bay complex, located in Star Lab's huge central hub. Meanwhile, a quarter of a million miles away, the draconian vampire ship continues to drift in a parking orbit, 1,000 kilometers above the dark side of the moon. With your permission, my lord. Yes, of course, Musk. My time is yours. The Armada will enter this star system two solar days hence. It will consist of 200 multi-atmosphere assault cruisers, a flight of 1,800 siege raiders, 600 defense penetrators, and 1,000 armed tankers. 1,000 tankers. Excellent. That's twice the number I expected. How did you manage it, Moss? A bribe, my lord. 9,000 fusion cubits of hydrogen to the Magistrate of the Opposition Alliance. Economic seduction. Still the broadest and most effective avenue to conquest, especially during a civil war. 9,000 fusion cubits. A small price to pay for 500 tankers the Magistrate will never see again. My assumption is correct, isn't it, Musk? Yes, my lord. Our shadow sentries boarded the Opposition tankers and neutralized the crews as the Armada was passing through the Twilight Meridian. Of course, the Twilight Meridian. Are you two strapped in back there? Anytime you're ready, John. 
All set. Okay, buddy. Let's do it. Synchronize all computer functions. We have a positive decoder interlock on all data terminals. Manual launch functions are canceled. Real-time status is 20 seconds to ignition and counting. Buddy, you know we don't know what the Draconians are going to do when they see us. So as soon as we get a fix on their ship, lock in our photon shielding and energy-absorbent field generators and activate all laser turrets. Okay, Skipper. Come on, Solaris. Let's go! Behind the moon, a Draconian command ship floats in orbit, waiting for the armada it will lead in a vampire assault against the hydrogen-rich oceans of the Earth. Aboard the Solaris, Buddy, John, Mora, and Dr. Valerie Reed, jetting toward the moon to investigate the bat-winged alien vessel from what they hope will be a safe distance. Solaris to Star Lab. Star Lab, go ahead, John. Our scanners have just locked onto the Draconian ship. It's hovering 50 kilometers above the Lucas Kubrick crater chain. THX coordinates 1138 at subvector 2001. We're locking in now. Thanks, Jerry. Solaris out. John, Valerie and I are getting a little edgy back here. Isn't there something we can do? How about a snack? Oh, buddy, how can you think of food at a time like this? It's easy. I'm hungry. Great, 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 great. Skipper, is there an echo in here? There is Mora? Incredible. What is it, buddy? Uh, would you believe a mysterious pool of talking light? Echo? Hello, Mora. Hello, Valerie. We'll be there in a flash. <laughs> you certainly will. Mora, Valerie. Oh, Echo, that was fantastic. Wow, what a rush. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. Echo, how do you get people from one place to another so fast? Mora, darling. She's been through the process before. Echo, I'm beginning to feel a little strange. Ah, uh, so am I. Me too. What's going on? You're all about to enter a metamorphic coma. And when you return to consciousness, you'll discover that in addition to being oxygen breathers, you'll be right at home in a hydrogen environment as well. Ooh. But why? You'll In the rhyme of the ancient mariner, Samuel Coleridge writes, O oh sleep, it is a gentle thing, beloved from pole to pole. She sent the gentle sleep from heaven that slid into my soul. A poem from the distant past perfectly echoing the deep metamorphic future sleep that silently enfolds Mora, John, Buddy, and Valerie on the extraterrestrial frontier of an alien world. side of the moon to investigate the draconian vampire ship. Eight minutes away from visual contact with the alien vessel, Echo, the keeper of eight, materializes and subjects Mora, John, Buddy, and Dr. Valerie Reed to molecular transmutation. A few moments later, they fall into a deep metamorphic coma that will radically alter their cellular pathology and body chemistry a transcendental sleep from which they will awaken with the ability to breathe lethal hydrogen. Ah, what year is it? It's still 2026, buddy. How do you feel? Well, that's the best snooze I've ever had. Echo, why have you made it possible for us to breathe hydrogen? So you can survive aboard the Draconian vampire ship. Oh, yeah? And me without my wooden steak. <laughs> and me without my Christopher Lee outfit. Echo, what do you want us to do? The very thing you all want to do. 
Teleport your vessel and meet them face to face. Well, that sounds very dangerous. The Draconians had planned to withdraw all the hydrogen from the oceans of Earth. It's a final desperate attempt at survival. They're not an aggressive race. They only use their armada as a bluff toward hostile intruders. If their system weren't so divided by the reactionary pressures of civil war, warp, mosque, and vena wouldn't be acting so silly. Warp, mosque, and vena? Who are they? Warp is head of the Draconian Coalition. Mask is his subordinate preceptor. And Vena is magistrate of the Opposition Alliance. Well, what can we do? Kill Warp and Mask where they can find alternate sources of pure hydrogen. How are we going to do that? I know where the sources are, Mora. And I'll tell you where they are before you see Warp and Mask. Well, wouldn't it be easier if you just told them yourself? Yes, it would. But if I did... Draconia and Earth would still be strangers to each other. You see, I arrange circumstances wherein strangers become friends. Now, how do you suppose they'll feel about Earthlings if you guarantee their survival for centuries to come? Are you sure we'll be safe? Buddy, you already are. Right. Right, we already are. Attention, Earth here. You're intruding into a Draconian defense perimeter. I believe there's a call for you, John. Uh, yeah. With your permission, my lord, my time is yours, Mask. The Earth vessel is holding its position. Is it a fighting ship? Yes, my lord. Five binary laser turrets and an ancillary system of particle beam injectors. Then our destruction is a certainty. The Earthlings don't wish to engage us, my lord. They've asked permission to come aboard. For what reason? They claim to have information that will ensure the survival of Draconia. Without going to war? Yes, my lord. Without going to war. Mm. What is your opinion, Mask? They know why we're here. They even know our names. Those two facts alone lead me to believe they've had a visitation from the Keeper. The Keeper wasn't always our enemy, Musk. Yes, my lord. Chaos. Desperation. Oh, this terrible civil war. We've gained more than we've lost, my lord. Yes, but our methods. Why were we so blind and arrogant, Musk? We should have begun our search for alternate sources of hydrogen half a century ago. Yes, we should have listened to the Keeper then. Perhaps the Earthlings are giving us one final chance to listen now. Have them come aboard, Musk. Yes, my lord. They're certainly taking their time about it, aren't they? Take it easy, Valerie. Echo wouldn't have left us alone out here if it wasn't safe. Attention, Solaris. You have been granted permission to come aboard. Guide your vessel under ours and enter through the illuminated docking bay. Will you require survival costumes? No, we're able to survive in your atmosphere. Proceed. Firing the inertia rockets of the Solaris, John slowly guides the sleek white interceptor under the huge black draconian ship and enters a docking bay illuminated with diffused violet light. As the shadow sentries stand silent, Mora, Buddy, John and Valerie move into the airlock of the Solaris. Warp, head of the draconian coalition regime, has decided to reconsider his attack on Earth's hydrogen-rich oceans. A decision based on a mysterious series of star charts Mora has given him. Forgive my skepticism, Mora. Are you absolutely certain these star charts are accurate? I'm positive, Warp. Well, we'll know soon enough. I didn't realize there were so many sources of hydrogen within our own galaxy. This planet here, it's uninhabited. Its atmosphere is hydrogen pure, and it's only a fractional light year away from Draconia. With your 
information, my lord. Yes, Blur. What is it? I have just received a report from our Equatorial Observatory. The three planets are there, just as the star charts indicate. Thank you, Blur. Mm. I didn't really notice them before. Well, to be perfectly honest, Warp, they weren't there before. You confuse me. The Keeper of Eight. So, the creation of these planets is his work. He didn't create them, Warp. They already existed. He simply uh, borrowed them from the Turalian system. With your permission, my lord. Come in, Contact the Armada. There will be no war with Terra or any other planet. We're going home. Oh, thank oh, goodness. Such a... a few moments later, Warp's message is flashed to the Draconian Armada as it enters Jupiter space. 200 multi-atmosphere assault cruisers, 1,800 siege raiders, 600 defense penetrators, and 1,000 armed hydrogen tankers slowly break formation, turn 180 degrees, and regroup near Callisto, one of Jupiter's nine moons. The Armada's new course? Draconia, by way of the Twilight Meridian. Meanwhile, in the launch bay of Warp's command ship, Mora, John, Buddy, and Valerie prepare to board the Solaris for their return flight to Star Lab. It's unfortunate that we couldn't have spent more time together, Mora. Well, we'll have plenty of time together at the beginning of Terra's new solar year, Warp. I don't understand. Six months from now, an intergalactic congress will convene on Star Lab. I'm going to arrange for Draconia to be represented. Thank you, Mora. I only hope, my lord. Mask, what's wrong? A communique from the Armada. As it was leaving Jupiter space, it passed a flight of opposition alliance tankers and siege raiders. Vina is proceeding with the assault on Terra. Wasn't she told the Keeper has provided? She dismissed the information as a deceit tactic to prevent her from reaching Terra before we do. Then it looks like we're right back where we started. Buddy, where are you going? To use the radio in the Solaris. Somebody has to tell Stargazer to scramble those interceptors. <laughs> That's my boy. Pilots and crews, attention. This is a priority combat alert. Launch factor, red. Rendezvous with Solaris at THX coordinates 1138, subvector 2001. As three squadrons of SET interceptors bank away from Stargazer and jet toward the dark side of the moon, John Buddy and Warp board the Solaris and blast out of the Draconian command ship's launch bay. The guidance thrusters on all our ships are located in outboard wing pods. By disabling any two pods on either wing, the ship will be unable to maneuver and will be forced to withdraw from combat. NZT leader to Solaris, we have you inside, over. Max, is that you? In person, John, what's happening? There's a flight of Draconian ships between Jupiter and Mars. Subvector coordinates 047, target grid Alpha 9 or 6, attack pattern Omega Blue. Now this is a non-lethal engagement, Max. Direct your fire at their wing pods only. Roger, wing pods only. Okay. Let's go. There they are, Skipper. John, before you commence the attack, I'd like to try to reason with Vina. Open a close proximity channel, buddy. Okay, Warp. Go ahead. Vina, can you hear me? I hear you, Warp. <laughs> the Keeper has placed infinite sources of hydrogen in our galaxy. Vina, this is Captain John Graydon, commander of Earthship Solaris. Warp is telling you the truth. Have you formed an alliance with Warp, Captain? Not just with Warp, with all Draconians. Warp doesn't represent all Draconians. I'm leading my ship to Terra. Solaris to SCT leader, over. Go ahead, Solaris. Take Blue Squadron in over the tankers. Will do, John. Skip, we got a bogey at 2 o'clock. 
Yellow Squadron, circle the perimeter of the tanker formation and watch for targets of opportunity. Roger. Red Squadron, behind us, two by two. Uh, Roger. Remember, wing pods only. Let's go. Solaris to all squadrons. Regroup at two one niner degrees and hold your positions. I got a scope on it, Skip. How's it look, buddy? Hard to tell. There's a lot of wing debris floating around out there. Alpina is now ready to listen to reason. Vox, have you a casualty report? There are no casualties, Vina. Neither death nor injury. It appears that the attack objective was to disable our ships, not take lives. I don't understand. You haven't understood for a long time, Vina. Echo. Vina. Vina, Vina, whatever am I going to do with you? You're such a fool. Am I? Yes. And the stubborn one at that. The Earthship attack wasn't calculated to destroy you. Only your belief in armed force and your conceit that you are right and war is wrong. War never determines who's right, Dana. Only who's left. Now, if you really care about the future of Draconia, you'll return to work ship with Captain Wake and stay there until you and work resolve your differences. I'll go, Echo, but I... No buts about it, Dana. Remember, those three hydrogen planets are a gift. And what the Keeper give us, the Keeper can guard well with love. You mean you've been trying to get these two together for 50 years? That's right, Mora. Half a century ago, I flew to war that Draconia's hydrogen would be totally depleted within 35 solar years. He said that was more than enough time to find alternate hydrogen sources and went on about his business. Then I told Nina, who finally made it known to the entire planet, but she turned around and used it as a political issue to agitate against war. How many times over the past 50 years have you tried to bring them together? I lost count, John, which for me isn't easy. I finally left them alone to learn their lessons the hard way. But when they decided to extend their foolishness to Terra, I came out of retirement. I'm glad it's over, Echo. Yes, thank you for returning us to ourselves. Echo, there's something I've been meaning to ask you. Why are you called the Keeper of Eight? Why, buddy, don't you know what you did when you laid the figure eight on its side? Infinity, the symbol for... Infinity, 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 infinity. I live inside eternal mist, where children dream and lips are kissed, and wander ancient starlit shores that lead through misty midnight doors. I tinker with time, I toy with space, I change the shape of fortune's face. Now you know why the keeper of eight has a name that rhymes with fate. The Keeper of Eight was written by Ron Thompson and starred Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Miller, and Corey Burton, with special guest stars Peter Leeds, Noreen Tuttle, Janet Waldo, Joe Mascolo, Pete Renaday, and Ellie Tompkins. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen. This is Roger Dressler, inviting you to join us for another adventure on Alien Worlds. <laughs>